Good morning, lovelies. Today we're going to talk about damsels in distress, what they are, the tropes issue of sexism, and how to actually write them without pissing off your femme audience. Before we get started, remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos on science fiction, fantasy, and horror through a feminist lens. If you'd like early access to these videos and want to join our Discord community, I have a Patreon page where you can do just that that's linked in the description. Patrons also get access to the short stories that I am posting for Story a Day in May, where you write one short story every day of the month. This is something that I highly encourage all writers to try. Even if they turn out crappy like mine, it's a very valuable writing experience. I'll even give you a prompt. Write a damsel in distress. And here's how you do that. So what is a damsel in distress? Strictly speaking, a damsel in distress is a young woman, specifically, who is in trouble, who needs to be rescued, often by a prince or a prince-like figure. In terms of storytelling, especially in the modern day, it is more broadly defined as any character, although still usually a woman because sexism, who is put in trouble and needs to be rescued. This is an incredibly useful tool in writing, especially in action and speculative fiction genres. You're putting a character in danger, which will raise the tension, especially if you have killed off characters earlier in the story. If it's the type of trouble that involves villains, then you get to show off your villain's characterization. You can write a rescue and any changing teen dynamics that comes from having the missing character and or rescuing them. I mean, their world is your oyster here with this one. The idea of damseling a character is solid and a lot of stories do it really well. Others, not so much. We got to talk about the gender thing. When a femme character only exists in a story to be rescued and or act as love interest, you've got a problem. This would be called the classic damsel. Think Princess Peach or early Disney princesses that nobody likes these days or the girlfriend in almost any superhero movie. Damsels in distress have almost always been women. That's how we got the original definition. And historically speaking, women were not expected to be able to handle themselves in any situation. Not financially, not politically, and especially not in a straight up fight. So it makes sense from a patriarchal view that of course most, if not all, damsels in distress, real or fictional, are going to be women. How could they possibly be expected to survive anything without a man there to help them out? This might not be your attitude specifically or the message that you're trying to get across with your story, but it is definitely what the audience is going to pick up on whenever we get a classic damsel situation in our media. And this long history has led to the misguided belief that if you're going to distress a character to the point of requiring rescue, it must be a woman in danger and a man who rescues her, regardless of whether or not the writer is feminist or sexist. Now I'm not going to say you can't or shouldn't damsel your femme characters. Damseling a woman is fine so long as a, it makes sense in universe, and B, she is given the opportunity to rescue the man back. Let's talk about A. So often, women are damseled by circumstances that, given what we have seen them do previously, they should be effortless for her to escape. But the plot makes her stuck there purely so the man can come in and save her. The reverse, of course, never happens. I have never seen a male character get damseled purely so he can be rescued by a woman. It's always his pride or wrath was too much and he picked a fight he couldn't win, you know, the character flaw thing. Or he risked slash sacrifice his life for a woman slash the world slash the mission slash whatever. Sometimes he will get damseled so the team can swoop in to save him, drilling into his head the meaning of friendship and teamwork. Occasionally there will be a woman or two in that team that assists with the rescue, but thanks to the Smurfette principle, they'll almost certainly be outnumbered by the men. Men saving other men from certain death is not considered an issue. It's practically a staple in war movies. Women saving men is considered risky, bold, even insulting to certain audiences. By the way, if you're insulted by the idea of a woman saving the man, even in fiction, think about why that is. I mentioned in my strong female character video something called the faux action girl. This is when the writers promise us an action girl slash strong female character slash otherwise badass woman capable of taking care of herself in a fight 
and then they fail to deliver. You can find the faux action girl because she will be described as an amazing fighter or have a really awesome backstory, but every time she physically appears in the story, she fails to deliver. She will prove to be completely useless, even detrimental to the fight, and she won't ever win in a fight except maybe her opener, in which case she also suffers from Trinity Syndrome, and she will otherwise completely disappoint your audience because you lied to them. What's happening here is that the writer is trying to write a strong female character for a modern, possibly feminist audience. They want the warrior woman. They want the next Eowyn, the next Xena, the next whoever. But they also want to write a damsel in distress. Now these two things can sometimes go together. If you do it properly, but a lot of the times they don't. And instead what you get is a female character who should, by all accounts, given what everyone has said about her and all the characters have spoken of her and even what she said about her backstory and maybe with her opening fight, she should be fine, but for whatever reason she just keeps losing all the other fights and keeps getting captured and keeps needing to be rescued. The writers don't even seem to realize that they're falling for this problem more often than not. As you can imagine, I hate this trope with a burning passion, right up there with Love Triangle and Pair the Spares. I don't like writers who set me up for disappointment. I especially don't like it when that is intertwined with sexism, intentional or otherwise. Let women actually be awesome. Full action girls end up damseled a lot and have a decent chance of actually dying because of it. Some popular examples, Flo Delacour is supposed to be the best student of her entire school, but she performs worst in all of the Goblet of Fire trials and needs to be rescued by Harry, who is at least three years her junior, twice. Sanja, an immortal warrior princess from the Underworld prequel Rise of the Lycans, doesn't win any fight that she is in, except the sword fight with Victor until he takes her hostage and then kills her. The most insulting offenders, in my opinion, are Yara Greyjoy and the Sand Snakes from Game of Thrones. Yara Greyjoy has an incredibly fierce reputation, but we never see her win a fight. In fact, the only time we see her properly fight is in season 7, where she gets captured by her uncle and needs to be rescued by her brother. The Sand Snakes are even worse. They are supposed to be the super dangerous warriors, each one more lethal than the last, but they only win against civilians, actually children, whom they ambush and poison. Their fight against Jamie Lannister is physically painful for me to watch. This is the show version, of course. They're written better in the books. Full action girls and improper use of damseling badass women are not just sexist, it's also a glaring writing error. Take Zombieland. Now, I genuinely like this movie, at least until Act 3. If you've never seen it, this is a horror comedy that centers around four characters. Columbus, who is a total coward, Tallahassee, who is a five-star badass, and two con artist sisters, Wichita and Little Rock, and they're all trying to survive the zombie apocalypse. Wichita and Little Rock make their debut by scamming the boys out of their truck and all of their weapons. It immediately sets them up as clever and ruthless. Both men mention at least once separately how intelligent these girls are, at least in relation to them. The message the movie is trying to give us is very clear. These two are smart. Their intelligence is what has let them survive for so long, both in civilization and in the zombie apocalypse. And yet, somehow, they decide that the best thing that they can do is go to an amusement park for the night, turning on all of the lights and all of the songs in an area full of zombies that have been demonstrably proven to be attracted to light and sound. Wichita even admits to Columbus that their goal of going to Pacific Playland is stupid, but she's doing it anyway so her sister can be a kid again. Great motive. Still stupid. Predictably, this goes horribly wrong and both girls need to be rescued by the men so Columbus can finish his character arc of overcoming cowardice and being the hero, getting the girl in the end. This is like the woman in the refrigerator trope, except instead of killing the woman to motivate the man, you're just dangling her off a cliff. I'm not saying 
these sisters needed to be rescued and that ruined the movie. I'm saying the writers completely botched their characters, having them make a monumentally stupid decision that ran counter to their established character as intelligent con artists. And that ruined the movie. If the writers wanted to damsel them at Pacific Playland, there are a bunch of better ways that they could have done that. Maybe they could have established them as idiots instead of intelligent right at the start. It would have made it even funnier that they keep outsmarting the boys every 10 minutes. Or an even better option would have been to completely rewrite their motivation and act three. A much better example of fair damseling comes from Avatar The Last Airbender. In the first season, when all the protagonists are untrained, it's very easy for various villains to capture them and give them trouble. Zuko is able to catch Katara by doing the wrist grab in the episode of the waterbending scroll because she hasn't yet mastered her powers, so she's SOL. She can't really fight back and she needs her friends to save her. Now this is an episode where she's also arguably acting like an idiot, sneaking off alone in the middle of the night to practice her waterbending. But it's not going against her character. She's been trying to master her powers since she found out she was a waterbender. This is her chance. Also, she is a 13 year old child not an adult who should know better. And then she does master her powers and Zuko and the other villains have a much harder time bringing her down. The old wrist grab no longer works. Katara gets damseled in seasons two and three only when she puts up incredible amounts of resistance and or has gotten ambushed. But she also gets to rescue other characters and has a fair shot at getting out of trouble herself. On top of that, all of the characters, male and female, get damseled at some point, and they have equal chances of rescuing each other and themselves, depending on the situation. The girls are not disproportionately targeted just because of their gender, or because they're the love interest of a male lead. In fact, Aang is usually the one who ends up damseled, because he is the Avatar. Everyone in the world is gunning for him. The rest of the team are just collateral. More importantly, everyone is able to escape their situation in a variety of ways. Sometimes they're able to get themselves out of it. Sokka outsmarts Jet's henchmen, Toph invents metal bending, Katara uses her sweat to break out of prison, and sometimes they need their friends, or even sometimes their enemies, to help them out. And that's okay. God, can you imagine what would have happened if a villain had tried the old wrist grab trick on Toph? The man would never have a hand again. You could also completely turn the gender roles on their head by having the woman rescue the man, like what happened in Mission Impossible 5. The earlier Mission Impossible movies are full of Tom Cruise rescuing various beautiful women from tricky situations. The fourth movie, Ghost Protocol, gives us a woman who, at the very least, can hold her own in a fight and act as an equal member of the team. And then movie five, Rogue Nation, completely split the script, giving us Elsa Faust, who explicitly rescues Cruise's character twice, while he leads the team in taking down the bad guys and in the process clearing her name. We're expecting the women to be in peril and the man to swoop in to save her, so it immediately subverts expectations if you have the man in peril and the women come to rescue him. Or have them both be men, or both be women, or throw in a non-binary character. And that is a good thing. Subverting tropes and expectations is a very valuable writing tool because it keeps your readers on their toes and further engages them in the story. Beware the distress ball. The distress ball is what happens when an otherwise uh, established badass character is damseled but makes no effort to escape their situation. I know I've single-handedly fought off a dozen men at once, but now that I'm in a jail cell, it's just so hard and difficult. So we better just wait for that rescue that the writer is gearing up for us. Like, uh, no! Do something! That's the whole reason we are following this story in the first place, is to watch characters do stuff! Especially if this is an established badass that we've seen kick ass and take names. Or like the case of the faux action girl, someone we've heard described as a badass. It's fine if they try to escape and fail. If you've provided significant evidence to prove that this is a true badass and not a faux action girl, this could even establish the villain as a serious, credible threat. But making them suddenly chill out and wait for rescue, or worse, botch the escape attempt purely for plot, that's just bad writing. Character above all else. It doesn't even really matter if the damsel gets out on their own. They're going to be a lot more interesting to watch if they at least make an attempt. A stellar example of this is Lucy McLean from Live Free or Die Hard. Now this teenage girl gets captured by the bad guys to be used against her superhero cop, 
dad. He's basically a superhero. She gets kidnapped as a hostage to be used against him. And she then proceeds to make the last half of the movie a living hell for her captors. She fights them at every turn. She spits in their faces. She smuggles out information to her dad. She does whatever she can to just make them miserable. She even manages to shoot one of the scariest bad guys in the foot trying to get a weapon to her father. I mean, it doesn't work, but it's still a really great scene to watch. Of course, then in the next movie, we find out that her brother gets to be this badass CIA agent who doesn't ever need rescuing. This is the gender thing, aka sexism. It would have been much better to have the brother be a squishy scientist, much like the hacker in Live Free. Handy for the plot, vulnerable and likely to need rescuing in the fight. Maybe his sister decided to learn how to fight after her traumatic experience and she becomes the badass CIA agent and she like helps her dad and rescues her brother? That would have been fun to watch. Now there is an exception to the distress ball. It's not even really the distress ball because it's not a writing error. This is severe emotional distress. In Toy Story, Buzz Lightyear is fully capable of escaping from Sid's house, especially with Woody there to help him out, long before he was strapped to the rocket and even after that, but he doesn't. He has just learned that rather than being a living, breathing person, he is a plastic toy manufactured for children's entertainment. He even talks about his days in the academy earlier in the movie, which suggests that he has memories in there of his time in the academy, probably memories of past missions, maybe even the family that raised him, and he has found out that they are all fake. He is going through an existential crisis here, and while maybe not suicidal per se, in that state of mind he's not exactly going to fight death. It's not until Woody gives him a pep talk that he is able to shake off his crisis and fight back. Possibly unrealistically, depression does not really work like that, but you know, it's Disney. So you've damseled your character in a way that does not scream outdated patriarchal gender roles. They have been pinned down by a natural disaster or pressed against the wall by villains or even captured. Now what? Well, now you get to have fun. What happens next depends largely on your characters. Consider how your damsel reacts given their personality, strengths, and weaknesses. Do they try to punch their way out? Do they pretend to play along with their captors, try a manipulation or diplomacy? Do they manage to get a signal out to their friends? This isn't a jewel or nuclear launch codes. This is an actual human being, or at least a character with a mind and thought process like a human being. And if we find ourselves in a situation we don't like, we are going to try everything we can to get out of it. Your readers have picked up your book to watch your characters do stuff. If your damsel is just sitting around waiting for rescue, that's not just bad characterization, it's boring. Alternatively, you could also torture your audience by not showing them what's going on with the damsel, dragging out the tension through a frantic search by their friends and villainous gloating and hints about what horrors they're going through. Avatar did this too with Suki. In terms of getting your damsel out of distress, assuming you want to, there are limitless possibilities. It could be a classic teammate or a romance rescue, or it's a trap if the situation is too much and the teammates now have to work with their damsel to get out, or villainous infighting happens and one of the people who captured the damsel actually helps break them out to serve their own ends. Maybe the damsel is actually handling the situation well enough on her own and when her friends show up to help her out or back her up, it actually endangers her and hinders her. Or maybe the teammates burst down the door for a rescue only to find that their damsel in distress has actually turned full on villain. Maybe they've been brainwashed or they were actually evil all along or whatever. Or the captors let the damsel go as part of their greater plan. The truth is there is no one way to write a damsel in distress. Like most tropes, the best I can do is offer you a vague set of guidelines and point out some of the more common pitfalls that I hope you can avoid. Damsel in distress has become synonymous with old sexist tropes that take away the agency of women characters, even though there is a growing chunk of media out there that no longer does that. So just be aware that this is what your audience is probably going to think of when they hear that your story utilizes this trope. Some people really like the classic damsels and their prince charmings. 
Others want more modern, more creative updates. Know your audience and write accordingly. That's all I've got. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you click this video because you are specifically a male author writing women, I have been told that this video has proven to be particularly helpful, so check that out. If you can, join us on Patreon. That link is in the description. Bye lovelies!